Okay, should we go ahead and get started? Um, yes. Good, um, good day, everybody. Um, my name is Lynn Goldman. I'm Dean of the Milken Institute School of Public Health. And it's my pleasure to invite you to our Dean's Seminar um, on um, racism and health. We have been exploring a number of topics in this area, and today's topic is about climate change and health. We're very fortunate to have on our faculty uh, people who are incredible leaders in this field. Um, Dr. Melissa Perry, who chairs our Department of Environmental and Occupational Health, as well as uh, Dr. Susan Annenberg, who's on our Faculty of Environmental and Occupational Health, and um, the person who we called on to, uh, to put this uh, seminar together. And I know that we have some very special guests with us today. I'm going to hand um, the podium over uh, to Dr. Annenberg to, uh, to begin us um, this um, morning. Susan, take it. Great, thank you so much, Dean Goldman, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm really excited to um, introduce this, uh, this topic and our excellent panel. Um, and so I'm gonna actually start by talking about some of the work that um, that our research group has been doing in the last year or so um, at the intersection of climate change, air quality, environmental justice, and, and public health, sort of as an entry point to the conversation. And then I'll turn it over to our uh, panel um, to give their perspectives. And at, at the end, we'll have about 10 or so minutes to have a moderated Q&A session that will be moderated by two of our current students. So really excited for the conversation here today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my slide. And I wanna start by talking about the Clean Air Act because the Clean Air Act just had its uh, 50th anniversary last year in 2020, a year that uh, many of us would like, to, would like to push away from our minds. Um, but yet it was a good moment to take stock of the success of the Clean Air Act and um, the challenges that, that remain. And actually the Clean Air Act is it's considered a really, really successful um, environmental law. It has reduced air pollution concentrations dramatically over the US since the 1970s and in particular since the 1990s. And you can, it's so successful, you can actually observe the nitrogen dioxide change over time from space. We have a, a network of earth observing satellites that are constantly taking images of the earth's atmosphere and we can actually see this dramatic drop in air pollution from space. And yet there's two really important challenges that remain that the Clean Air Act has not addressed. Um, and I'm gonna talk about those today. The first is climate change. So the way that we have reduced our um, air pollution concentrations is largely through technological controls. Things like catalytic converters on our cars and diesel particulate filters on our trucks, um, scrubbers on our power plants. These are really effective ways to take air pollution out of effluent streams but they do nothing for greenhouse gases. And so climate change is just continuing unabated. And of course, climate change is contributing to worsening air pollution over time um, by uh, leading to larger wildfires and uh, more dust storms and more smog formation, for example. Um, so to reduce both um, air pollution and greenhouse gases, we can target the same uh, emission sectors. The other um, challenge that the Clean Air Act has is that it has not reduced air pollution equitably. We have study after study that shows that um, air pollution concentrations are higher in communities of color and communities with lower educational attainment and uh, lower income levels. Um, and in fact, the air quality monitoring network that the EPA set up to um, determine whether counties are attaining the national ambient air quality standards we're not intended to uh, be able to tease out these neighborhood scale um, effects. So they, you know, we have a handful of monitors for the whole Washington DC region. And this tells us whether our overall regional air quality is improving, but it doesn't tell us whether one neighborhood might be more exposed than another neighborhood. Luckily we have sort of a confluence of events here where we have an administration that has put climate change and environmental justice as two of their top priorities. At the same time, we have expanding capabilities to do exposure assessment. We have satellite remote sensing, and we have another technique that I'm going to talk about um, now, which is a um, which is a, uh, mobile monitoring of, of air pollution. So uh, this is a, a study that we've been doing over the last year. It should be coming out next week in the journal called Environmental Health Perspectives. 
um, where we partnered with the Environmental Defense Fund, who, who themselves partnered with Google to outfit every, uh, not every, but at, uh, Google Street View mapping cards with air quality sensors and drive these around Oakland, California. And what they did is they drove every street of Oakland, California, taking measurements of air quality. We were able to combine that information with neighborhood scale information about disease rates and try to estimate how air pollution health risks vary within a city. And in fact, within even a portion of the city in West Oakland, California, an environmental justice community that is exposed to very high levels of uh, traffic related air pollution, as well as air pollution from other sources. We found 38 fold variation in mortality attributable to traffic related air pollution across the Bay Area, California. And this was driven not just by air pollution concentrations, but also the disease rates, the vulnerability of the population that is breathing in um, these air pollutants. So we were going about this study, um, under, you know, increasing our understanding of how traffic related air pollution contributes to inequities and air pollution health risks within cities when a dramatic natural experiment occurred, and that is the lockdowns due to the pandemic. And now, of course, um, you know, we don't want this lockdown, we don't want this natural experiment, but it's a natural experiment that we're all living through where we saw passenger vehicle traffic drop by about 50%. And with that 50% drop in passenger vehicle traffic, we've been able to uh, sort of isolate one important emission uh, sector when all other emission sectors were relatively constant through the pandemic. Um, also, at the same time, our, we were already using satellite remote sensing to study air pollution levels within cities. And so we were sort of at this perfect position to use the satellite remote sensing um, to study the changes that occurred during the natural experiment and try to understand, did population subgroups around the country experience the same reductions in nitrogen dioxide or were some population subgroups uh, did they experience you know, more reductions in traffic related air pollution compared with, with other uh, communities? And this is a study led by our postdoc, Gage Kerr, that is in the final stages of re review right now, um, which shows that the, the COVID-19 pandemic reveals persistent disparities in NO2 pollution. So I just wanna break this down for a minute. Um, the graph on the right shows NO2 levels in the least white communities shown in the orange points and versus the most white communities shown in the blue points. The connecting line that is solid indicates the baseline period that's before COVID and the dashed line indicates the lockdown period that's during COVID. So what we see is that in the baseline period, the NO2 levels in the least white census tracts were already about two times higher than levels in the most white tracts prior to the pandemic. That's really unfortunately not that surprising because there's other studies that have shown that uh, you know the, that communities of color are experiencing much higher levels of air pollution compared with more white communities. But what was very surprising is that during the pandemic, um, the concentrations of NO2 dropped for both the least white census tracts and the most white census tracts. But if you compare the orange dots con connected to the dashed connecting lines to the blue dots connected to the solid connecting lines we see that the least white communities experienced higher levels of nitrogen dioxide during the pandemic than the most white communities faced prior to the pandemic. So even about a 50% drop in passenger vehicle traffic was not enough to bring NO2 concentrations in the, most, in the least white census tracts down to the levels experienced by the most white census tracts prior to the pandemic. And similar results held for ethnic income and educational attainment population subgroups. So um, we're working now on trying to understand the contributors to NO2 disparities across the United States. But one thing this is showing us um, is that uh, it's not just passenger vehicle traffic that is important, um, but also um, uh, diesel uh, trucks. And it was really pointing the finger actually at diesel trucks. If you look at the primary road density on the top uh, graph here, um, we see that the, there's much higher primary road density to the left portion of this graph uh, correlated with communities that, are, that have lower income, that have less education, and that are less white. And that's, that sort of uh, correlation is not the case for indus industrial sources. So industrial sources are not as spatially correlated with these communities compared with road density. Um, so in addition to on-road um, passenger vehicles, we need to also be considering and reducing nitrogen dioxide from heavy duty uh, trucking as well. 
So what does this all have to do with climate? Well, anytime we reduce fuel burning, we're reducing both greenhouse gases and air pollutants, and those have many health benefits. But targeting some fuel combustion sources may go further to advance environmental justice and health equity. And we've been pointing the finger in our work at um, heavy duty trucking, and I'm very interested to hear the perspectives of our panel here today. Um, they really come from a variety of um, a variety of backgrounds and a variety of professional um, experiences. And it's my true pleasure to welcome them to be a part of this panel. Um, so we will hear from Dr. Adrian Hollis. Uh, Adrian is the Senior Climate Justice and Health Scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists. And she's also a prof professorial lecturer in the Environmental and Occupational Health Department at uh, GW. And in this role, she leads the development, design, and implementation of methods for accessing and documenting the health impacts of climate change on communities of color and other traditionally disenfranchised groups. Prior to joining UCS, she served as the Director of Federal Policy at REACT for Environmental Justice. Um, after Dr. Hollis, we will hear from Dr. Jalan White Newsom. Uh, Jalan is the CEO and founder at Empowering a Green Environment and Economy, LLC. She's also a professorial lecturer at the Environmental and Occupational Health Department at GW. She was previously at the Kresge Foundation. Um, she was a senior program officer responsible for the Environment Program's grant portfolio on climate resi resilient and equitable water systems and supporting Kresge's climate change, health, and equity initiative. And prior to joining Kresge, she was also um, at REACT for Environmental Justice. And then finally, we'll hear from Dr. Melissa Perry. She's the Chair of the Environmental and Occupational Health Department at uh, GW. She's a leading public health researcher and she has wide ranging epidemiologic and preventive intervention uh, uh, studies over the past two decades. And in addition to her many very teaching and research roles, she's truly been a leader in ensuring that our programs here at uh, the, in the Environmental and Occupational Health Department address environmental justice and, and climate change to the extent that, to the extent that they, they deserve. Um, so with that, I will welcome Dr. Adrian Hollis. Thank you, Dr. Annenberg. And thank you to um, Georgia, to the George, excuse me, George Washington University Milken School of Public Health and the faculty and staff and to all of our attendees, I'm very excited to be here. So I wanna speak briefly about why systemic racism is a public health issue and what its relationship is to environmental justice and, and to climate change and, and climate change's impact on communities, what that looks like, and then use COVID-19 as a, an example of just how all of these issues come together and result in what we call the ascendemic. So I'll begin with systemic racism. So in here in the US, systemic racism has affected black and brown people, I guess, in every aspect of our lives, from education to employment, the housing to health care, from the water we drink to the air we breathe. And, and it takes many forms. Uh, you know, one of them is redlining, which has been outlawed, but still occurs in, in um, some form or fashion. So what is redlining? It is, a, it, actually, it is as described. It, was, it began in 1930s, and it was back at that time by the federal government, where many banks uh, literally outlined areas in major cities, urban areas, um, in red if they were a majority black to say that these are communities where um, mortgages should be denied because there is um, there's a greater chance of them uh, forfeiting on those loans. And then of course they had areas that were considered um, a little less undesirable. Those were normally in yellow, like this is turning into a black community. They, they had um, blue, which is better. And then they had green which was a majority white community. And so it wasn't just used for mortgages, but it was also used to determine places, the best places to live. And so because of redlining and other issues, including like racially restrictive housing covenants, which prohibited black Americans from buying certain properties in certain areas, um, it prevented generations of families from gaining equity in the home ownership or from uh, beginning to develop generational wealth. And two other terms you should be familiar with, NIMBY, NIMBYism, not in my backyard, is um, a term that originated in the US and it's usually used by communities that uh, of greater wealth and usually white communities to say, we don't want facilities in our communities. We don't want 
landfills or hazardous waste facilities or recycling plants in our neighborhood to the point where we don't care where they go if they're not here. And they traditionally end up in communities of color, environmental justice communities, um, communities with Black Americans. And uh, the final word that I would like you to know is Lulu, which is locally unwanted or locally undesirable land use, including power plants and landfills where people didn't want them. Now, uh, it, the chances of a, um, a business wanting to move into a community with a Lulu or with a hazardous waste site is slim to none. So these communities, our communities were also, um, were also um, um, unable to, in, to develop economic power because they couldn't get good jobs and they couldn't bring businesses into the community. So all of these things were affected by systemic racism. Um, a big part of systemic racism is the environmental contamination that was present. Um, and, and that led to the issue of what was originally called environmental racism and is now environmental justice, where you place black communities and other communities of color and poor communities directly in the path of producing, excuse me, pollution producing industries like landfills and incinerators, and in some instances, com confined animal feeding operations. And so long before Mr. Eric Gardner or Mr. George Floyd or the 70 plus other people who were murdered while, screen while saying that they could not breathe, communities, black communities and communities of color were insisting that they had an inability to breathe thanks in large part to where they live and the contaminants to which they were exposed on a daily basis. And their voices were largely ignored, but it's hard to ignore the data. For example, people of color are much more likely to live near facilities, uh, near polluters and breathe polluted air. They had 1.35 times higher burden of facilities in their communities than the average population. And non-whites had a 2.8 times higher. So the first group was of Black Americans, which is with a 54% increase for African Americans in those facilities in their neighborhoods. They were also exposed to environmental pollution at a rate, a rate that far exceeds their white counterparts. And we heard some of this from Dr. Annenberg. When we talk about pollutants, one of the ones that I'd like to just bring up quickly is um, particle pollution or PM, particulate matter because this is important. Um, there, is a, a, there are studies that have been done about the potential relationship between particulate matter and COVID-19. And the, thought, the theory being that the COVID-19 uh, virus particles sort of hitch a ride on particulate matter, which allows them to enter into the lower lobes of the... Of the... So if you have a, a person uh, who is already at risk because they're breathing in polluted air and, and being exposed to environmental contaminants. They're already compromised, right? They already have difficulties in breathing. They have increased asthma rates, increased chronic obstructive pulmonary um, disease rates, increased cardiovascular issues. But also because of where they live, they may lack access to healthy foods so that you may see increases in diabetes and other health effects. All of these pre-existing conditions make people more at risk from uh, other environmental harms. For example, just talking about um, uh, climate change, severe weather uh, events, for example, is talk about heat. Um, communities were placed uh, because of racist practices, as I mentioned earlier, in areas that did not have much green space. So some of them are considered to be urban heat island where the heat is absorbed by the concrete during the day and released slowly at night, but there's really nowhere for it to go. There's very little tree cover. Access to parks is um, something that most people in uh, these communities are not familiar with. Um, also, because of infrastructure issues, the, uh, some of the communities that I work with have said what we're doing is heating or cooling the outside because the homes are so are lacking in um, structure or correct being correctly built. Also, because of the, the fact that these communities, as I mentioned earlier about the economic aspects, live below the poverty line in most cases, they can't afford to pay a, a utility bill. So they don't run the air conditioner or they don't run the heat if they have access to it. And those are things that have to be considered and have to be addressed when we talk about the effects of climate change. Also, 
half, almost half of uh, Latinx and Black um, uh, Americans, Black people live near national priorities or Superfund sites and are, and are also exposed to diesel particulate matter. And we've just heard Dr. Annenberg talk about that, the um, proximity to high traffic areas. So lack of green space, lack of cooling centers, energy bills, all of those things are um, some of the effects that we see. And when you add that to uh, the health effects that we see um, in these communities in general, living in an area that recently flooded. You can't afford to have your home raised, so you can't get home insurance. So you may be living in a home that is, for example, filled with mold. Now that is another um, attack on your respiratory system. So let's just say that that is the current condition. Then you, in, in, um, you know, um, we see the appearance of COVID-19. This pandemic has highlighted a host of racial and geographic and class disparities. We know that Black, Hispanic, and Native Americans have died and are dying from COVID at nearly three times the rate of their white counterparts. And that was according to a CDC analysis. Non-Hispanic Black and Asian healthcare workers are more likely to contract COVID and die from it than their white counterparts. So what we have now with all of these, with racism, with um, environmental exposures, environmental challenges, environmental threats, and climate change, and COVID-19 is a syndemic. A syndemic is a set of linked health problems that interact and compound each other's effects. Any one of these on their own can be deadly, can be deadly, but together they are spectacularly um, effective in causing death and illness among minority communities. We've come full circle, and hopefully I've shown you how systemic racism is the public health threat that a lot of um, agencies and entities are calling it, and that many of us are dealing with these every day. And because of systemic racism, and because of all of these other conditions, lives are destroyed and health is destroyed. But there is hope, and I think we'll be talking about that later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hollis. And we will turn it over now to Dr. Jawan White Newsom. Hello, everyone. Can you see my slides? Yes, but okay. they're not awesome. in the <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, let me just. Uh... So first of all, thank you, Dean Goldman and Dr. Annenberg and Dr. Perry for the opportunity to be here today and even having this conversation. And I just wanna also appreciate my friend and colleague, Dr. Hollis as always for setting the stage wonderfully. And so I'm just gonna add a little bit more, um, but before I jump into my comments, I want to acknowledge that I am calling from my home in Southeastern Michigan on the original but stolen lands of the Potawatomi. So when I reflect on the opportunities that I've had to work across different sectors, this conversation around environmental justice raises a couple of questions. When I think about the time I spent as a chemical engineer working in manufacturing in really, really nasty plants uh, across this country, I often ask the question, why are most of our nastiest manufacturing facilities always located in low-income communities or communities of color. And then I had the opportunity to work for state government. And I questioned uh, to Dr. Annenberg's uh, point earlier, why the air monitoring system seemed to not be as present in the hot spots or the communities that really needed to know what pollution they were breathing in. And while I was at, uh, we act for environmental justice for a couple years and running the federal policy office. I continue to ask the same question why on Capitol Hill, there weren't enough advocates representing the issues of low income communities and communities of color in these offices talking about health and climate and equity. And then I think again on my last five years in philanthropy as a grant maker and why in 2020 and now in 2021, we still see these ridiculous disparities between the amount of funds going to people of color led organizations versus white led organizations or mainstream environmental organizations. 
And so as I continue to ask these questions, which I hope you can appreciate as students and researchers, uh, I cannot not think about the environmental injustice and the way it shows up in all these particular spaces and places. And so that brings me to the question that I want to posit to you all today. Who's most vulnerable, the institution or the people? So as public health professionals, we tend to use the word vulnerability, um, but really I don't know of too many people that like to be labeled as vulnerable. But when I think about my grandparents who have gone on to heaven now, but lived in their late 80s and 90s, and I was their primary caregiver for some time, and it was my responsibility to make sure that the systems, whether it be the healthcare system, the utility providers, social services, worked on their behalf. And so while my grandparents had some characteristics, definitely that would make them more at risk, particularly to the impacts of climate change and extreme heat, which drove the subject of my dissertation research. It also really exposed the vulnerabilities of the institutions and systems that contributed to their risk. So from a climate change standpoint, there were many things. The limited understanding of how homes could actually be hazardous to your, hazardous to your health if they were in urban heat islands with no parks and less green space. The fact that energy remained unaffordable, particularly for folks on a fixed income, a lot of the seniors that I work with, that doctors really weren't making the connection between climate impacts and the environments that many of the seniors were living in. And then this translation of heat science and hazards had not yet woven itself through the institutions that were supposed to protect people like my grandparents and their neighbors. So, when I think about that and the fact that I've been working on these issues for many years, I again, notice trends in my grandparents' experiences and even in my work experiences that just seem to be the same things that exacerbate these injustices, particularly on the climate side. So I think about the systems that blame the individual, particularly low-income communities and communities of color versus the system being broken. Because we know that again, we only can make the choices that we can in our environment. And if our environment doesn't present us with choices that can help us be healthy and sustain us, then that's a problem. Really not acknowledging to Dr. Hollis's point, the racist policies, both historical and current, that again, contribute to the lower baseline of health that we see in many of our communities because of lack of access, because of lack of access to good education or investment, or even the ability to get COVID testing. And then I think about, which is really, again, striking, but the insufficient root cause analysis that happens around the disparities that we do see. That oftentimes we don't ask the question why enough and get down to really what is driving this disparity. Leaving the impacted folks out of the solution. So coming up with solutions in a box or in an ivory tower that doesn't involve those that are most impacted. And of course, the thing that I hit on all the time is accountability or the lack there of accountabilities, particularly for the institutions that are supposed to protect us and our health. So our reality of climate injustice and health disparities is one that is really of no surprise because we are on shaky foundation. I hope you all can agree. And as it's been stated before, our health is connected to so many things, where we live, how much we make, our education, how we are treated or mistreated in our legal system, our access to green space, all these different pieces. And so when I think about these injustices and, and the factors and their connections, I get excited because we all have the power to actually shift this. We have the power to change what we're seeing. We can begin to rebuild a stronger foundation by challenging those norms, by using research and data and science and partnerships to disentangle the conditions that continue to elevate the risk, particularly for our indigenous brothers and sisters, our low-income communities, our communities of color, and other folks that are at risk. And so what's great is that there are organizations that have already been and beginning to challenge these norms and set the stage for a stronger foundation particularly at this intersection of climate change, health and environmental injustice. And so as I think about many of the public health leaders, the community health workers that are on the front line have been on the front line, the nurses, the medical practitioners, and those that we are partnering with in communities, 
What has been critical, I think, to their progress has always been shaping their solutions and keeping people at the center. Because we can do good planning, we can protest, we can write good policy and, and change our practices and use our power for good, but all of that is not, is done for naught if we don't keep people at the center of what we're doing. And so as a recovering DC policy advocate, I am heartened and encouraged by the current administration statements and efforts to make climate change and racial justice a priority, particularly across all government institutions. And I was reflecting because back in 2016, I had written this piece in a journal called The Black Scholar that highlighted the characteristics of what an approach to climate justice could look like. And I'm excited because several of the ideas that were presented in this, this paper have been elevated on multiple community platforms and efforts by advocates across the country, which again is super exciting and a change from what we've seen over the past several years, or at least the last four. But again, we can't just rely on policy. We have to consider the vulnerability of all of our institutions that we depend on. Our healthcare system, our schools of higher education, our institutions that deliver water and energy, our local, state, and federal governments in places of research. Because the climate and environmental justices we continue to see are the result of racism and the shaky foundation that we have built in this United States, and we have to change. So how do we begin to change philanthropy? How do we begin to change how we invest and what we invest in? How do we begin to shape research questions that get at the root cause? And how do we run our government? Again, we already have foundational principles like the environmental justice principles and the climate justice principles that were, that were created decades ago to start from. So we're not starting from scratch. But my humble suggestion is that in terms of the institutions, there are three things that need to be done. Institutions, first of all, need to create intersectional agendas and platforms and policies that align with the support and the needs of community experts and those that have been harmed the most. Again, that, that needs to drive the work at an institutional level. The second piece is that institutions must begin to do their own equity analysis. Again, ask those questions, who's benefiting, who's being hurt unintentionally, and how can we do this better? And last but not least, I believe institutions must build in a system of accountability because again, we can't change what we don't measure. So again, as a public health practitioner, whether you're current or future or changing or wherever you sit, I encourage you to utilize your power and privilege to adapt. And that is acknowledging harm, demanding accountability, addressing racism, power and privilege, prioritizing equity in whatever you do. And in that way, we can begin to transform systems and doing that in a way that is in love and not fear. So I hope you might've answered this question for yourself. And really, as I think about the core tenet of my practice now in terms of transforming communities using people-centered solutions, I firmly believe that the only way we are gonna to begin to change the lives of folks like my grandparents, my parents, and probably many folks you know, is to begin to transform these institutions and rebuild back on a solid foundation. So again, our institutions must begin to honor the right of everyone despite where you come from, what you look like, or who you're connected to. So we can get to that aspirational environmental justice where people can live, work, play, and pray in homes and communities that offer the quality and the quantity of life that everyone deserves. So with that, thank you so much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. White Newsom. And we will turn now to Dr. Melissa Perry. That was inspiring. Wow. I feel so grateful, extremely grateful. Dr. Annenberg, Dr. Hollis, Dr. White Newsom, you do us real pride. And um, it's a real pleasure to have you in this Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at GW. Um, your vision, your research, your messages are really inspiring. Um, thanks everyone for putting this together as a really important opportunity to highlight these major intersections between environmental justice and climate change. I wanted to just uh, make a couple of brief points about the science because it very much feeds the source of inequity. So if we understand about um, uh, carbon dioxide being the most important greenhouse gas and the way in which uh, emissions have uh, 
have advanced, just gonna, um, have advanced uh, over the past um, century. At the same time, the way in which temperature has changed radically, it really demonstrates what's been happening on a global scale. And the question becomes, well, how is this distributed uh, globally? Um, we know that in terms of the current carbon dioxide levels um, that were at 405 parts per million, an increase in about 1.8 degrees uh, Fahrenheit since pre-industrial levels, that by 2050, we are looking at two degrees Celsius, 450 parts per, um, per million increase, which really puts us at a dangerous tipping point. And then here's the goal for the uh, Paris Accord that the U.S. pulled out of, um, that we're due, hopefully the Biden administration will put the U.S. back in, um, of 1.5 um, Celsius increase. Um, that's really where we're trying to get, but you can recognize how that um, measures below where we actually need to be, but how much work and how much effort it's taking to get there. So why do I bring this up? I bring it up because of when you think about this globally, where the distribution of emissions come from, you quickly see across the globe that the most um, highest levels of emissions are not coming and not distributing equally. They're coming from the more industrialized, um, higher income countries. But how about the burden? How about the burden of impacts? And where does that happen? Where, who's at highest risk? And I raise this to talk about it on a macro scale and bring it down to a micro scale. So the emitters are um, the most affluent countries, the most resourced countries, the uh, countries that are experiencing the ravages, the burdens of climate change are the more under-resourced countries. And that is very much playing out as we've been hearing from our presenters in terms of how it impacts the United States. Um, what are we doing about it? So it seems as though when uh, I first came to the department about 11 years ago, the importance of climate change was really just emerging, if you can imagine, because things have moved very, very quickly in the past 10 years. So in fact, when I came to be department chair and said, our department's gonna have a very strong focus on climate change, believe it or not, that was partly controversial. There was still a lot of detraction. There's still a lot of skepticism just 11 years ago. And other department veterans like Dr. Peter LaPuma can attest to the fact that very few people at that time in the country were talking about the intersection between climate change and public health. Um, so it's only in recent years have we really said, well, actually, what parts of public health are not um, being impacted by climate change? Um, if you really think about it, and if public health is very much in access to medical care, and so when you're extre experiencing extreme weather events, look like extreme heat or uh, tropical storms or arid conditions or power outages like we just saw in Texas, you can't get access to medical care if your basic electrical systems aren't working. But what's interesting also, not only that it took us this long to come to terms with the fact that climate change is all about public health. Also, these inequities that we've been talking about, it has not been obvious. And it's really through the murder of George Floyd and this awakening to environmental justice and systemic racism, have we seen the critical intersection. So globally, we're seeing major inequities, but um, locally in this country, we're also seeing major inequities as spoken about so eloquently by Dr. Hollis and Dr. Uh, White Newsom. So Dr. Newsom asked us, what, what are you all gonna do about it? And I'm sure that there are many students online today and we really want you to take away a message of tremendous opportunity. I heard uh, optimism from Dr. Hollis, from Dr. White Newsom, tremendous opportunity. Um, I can say personally, the past four years have been a dark period in realizing some of the opportunity that I knew when I came to GW, we could accomplish as a department being in the nation's capital. I thought that we were poised to make major aggressive change on climate action. And the past four years have been difficult to endure. But the good news is that 
there's no better time like than now to be involved in environmental justice activism and also climate and health research, um, public health uh, uh, awareness, um, public health um, um, uh, analysis, and also policy and contributing to those areas that we know are very, very uh, much necessary and where we have to make major inroads. So I wanted to give you a few examples of what's happening in EOH. We've just launched the online MPH concentration in climate and health. Um, this was work that the department had put forward, um, led by Dr. Annenberg, Dr. Sabrina McCormick, and others contributing to getting more and more focus in, in um, climate and health. Our longer term vision is actually an online uh, MPH EOH degree in that area, but for the time being, we'll be offering this concentration and that will be um, uh, offered starting in September. We also have um, assembled a climate and health center and that's been bringing people together across the university, students, uh, researchers, uh, very much interested in climate and health, uh, very much led by Dr. Annenberg, uh, several students that are funded by a um, GW grant, uh, Dr. McCormick, Dr. LaPuma, they're, they're all contributing to convening greater and greater uh, interest, both from a research and a public health perspective. And then also the Climate and Media Lab. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, Dr. Sabrina McCormick's work. She's had uh, international acclaim in telling stories about climate and health and bringing a very um, informative and also personal perspective in an artistic way. And so her lab is um, a way in which she can bring students and um, into learning how to um, uh, produce documentary films that are very much science-based and science-informed. We also um, have the Environmental Justice Action Network that was founded uh, by Lauren Johnson, um, uh, one of our moderators for today's panel. And so um, I'm gonna ask Lauren to put the link in the chat so that you can have access to getting more information about the um, Justice Action Network that students can be involved with. It's entirely a student-run, student-founded organization focusing on environmental justice. Um, we've been doing a number of things in our department, including our uh, diversity and inclusion subcommittee, uh, which has developed a series of presentations on in environmental justice issues. Um, here's a list of some of the many topics that we're covering at the um, end of uh, on March 29th, we'll be talking about water uh, policy and research and environmental justice. And I'm rushing through this because I want to get to the panel. And I also wanted to mention the important work of Dr. Ami Zota um, and her colleagues at Environmental Health News. They have given voice to neglected uh, voices. They've given um, uh, prominence to neglected voices in environmental health and environmental justice. And this is focused on um, uh, up and coming researchers and leaders uh, of color who are providing blogs and also podcasts to shine a light on environmental um, health and environmental justice issues um, that are timely. So my message to all of you is that climate change at its very heart is a phenomenon of injustice. It exacerbates uh, injustice and disparities and that there is much that we're doing and much that you all can do to contribute to reducing those greenhouse gas, gas emissions and impacting uh, and affecting uh, communities of color that are more disproportionately impacted about, uh, from climate injustice. So with that, I'm excited to get started with the panel. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry. Uh, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, such inspiring and motivating uh, talks. Just really appreciate hearing your perspectives. And I'm just feeling really grateful to be a part of this uh, department and part of this school uh, and to be able to know you all. Um, so now I want to transition to our uh, Q&A moderated discussion. And we're going to uh, be joined by two of our current MPH students in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at GW. And so we already heard about Lauren Johnson. Uh, Lauren Johnson is an MPH student in Environmental Health Science and Policy. She's the a uh, co-founder of the Environmental Justice Action Network at GW and is um, helping to support the Climate and Health Research Network at GW. Thank you, Lauren, for being here. 
And also Nick Pendleton um, is also an MPH student uh, working on his global environmental health MPH um, and is also supporting the Climate and Health uh, Research Network at GW. And um, Nick uh, was, was a co-author on a study that got a lot of attention and is um, still being reported on by the New York Times data team um, showing how redlining has contributed to persistent um, disparities in heat exposure in uh, US cities. So thank you, Nick, for that work and for being here today. And I'll turn it over to you guys. Thank you, Dr. Edinburgh. Uh, first of all, thank you all panelists for such an enlightening seminar. We definitely learned a lot about a conversation that needs to be addressed more often. Um, so we'll first start with some questions and we would also like for any and all uh, attendees to post questions in the Q&A so that we can uh, address those. But the first one uh, could be for Dr. Amberg, Dr. Aulis, or Dr. White Newsom. Should we focus more on climate mitigation or adaptation when lawmakers are producing equitable climate policies to combat air pollution and achieve climate justice? Um, I'll start. Um, um, so just from um, the work that I do, while I think that both are, are necessary, I think right now we do focus more on mitigation and uh, in order to create resilient um, communities, we need to prepare ahead of time as opposed to picking up the pieces afterwards. And that is just um, from discussions with communities who are, their questions have been, people know that this area is going to flood. People know that you know these are where we live is more susceptible to whatever the extreme weather can, uh, effect is. So why aren't they prepared in advance? Why don't they prepare in advance and give us what we need so that we are able to um, you know rebound or prepare for exposure? So thank you. I'll just add, yeah, I think um, both is the easy answer, but I but I do think it's the answer I'm going to go with because. You know, I, mitigation is imperative. I mean, we have to be undertaking mitigation to avoid really dangerous climate change in the future. Um, at the same time, we can't wait. Uh, there are people suffering now. And so we also need to be undertaking adaptation and, and doing both in parallel. Um, mitigation is where I think we'll, you know, achieve all these co-benefits that I was talking about, where if we burn less stuff, you know, figure out ways to uh, reduce our combustion of fossil fuels, of biofuels, um, we will mitigate both climate change, air pollution, um, contribute to public health improvements and, you know, in ways that extend beyond heat and air quality and extreme events too. If you think about things like shifting transportation from personal vehicles to bike ridership and active transportation, we get phys physical activity and cardiovascular benefits as well. And the list is honestly, you know, too long to, to mention here in terms of the co benefits of mitigation. So I'll stop there and see if uh, anyone else wants to apply to. Yeah, the only woo, the dog wants to reply too. The only thing that I would add is uh, I would say both and. I, I think definitely historically a lot of effort has been spent on mitigation, which is great because we need to address the source of the problem. But of course, communities have been suffering and continue to suffer because adaptation has taken a back seat. But what I will say as we go down both of those paths, we cannot not make sure that we, when we do respond, that we're not recreating the problem. Because I think a lot of, even when we do begin to adapt, sometimes we adapt in, I would say a stupid way. <laughs> and so we're actually not solving the problem for the issue that happened. So how do we build back? Not in the same way, we need to build back differently and smarter. So I would just add that on. All right, great. Um, so for, I just wanted to echo that I really love the presentation. Thank you so much to the panelists for being here. But um, for our next question for Dr. Perry, she was um, asking about the climate health concentration and when it can become available. If you're already enrolled in the program, could you also enroll in that as well? Yeah, yes, you certainly can. It will be available in uh, September. So now's a great time to be looking at the program and um, Dr. Annenberg, Dr. Uh, McCormick have information about it. Um, we're getting the um, uh, advertisement distributed on the web very, very soon. And so this was a 
fortuitous opportunity to make sure that everyone was available. It's really intended, we already have a great bolus of courses online that are uh, focused on climate and health, uh, including sustainable energy, um, climate change, social change, and a course that I've been teaching for the past four or five years, which is researching climate and health. Um, and then we're also offering a new course, which is looking at climate change and systemic change, which is from the perspective of a variety of different um, uh, uh, lenses, policymakers, uh, documentary filmmakers, um, uh, atmospheric scientists, uh, epidemiologists, um, those different um, uh, angles that people take to contribute to actual solutions, both the science and also the communication and the policy impacts. So that course is going to uh, feature a variety of different perspectives. But yes, we're ready to go live in uh, September. As I say, it's taken a lot of care and feeding and TLC to make it happen, but it also has been very much in response to our students. So I talk about the darker days where we, we couldn't always get traction as to the connections between climate and health, if you can imagine. Well, our students are pushing and clamoring for more and more, and that's what we're responding to. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Perry, for the answer. I do understand we are at time at 1 o'clock PM, and I know you have an obligation um, at this moment. But if anyone else is available to stay on, we would like to get through a few more questions. Um, so one of them is, just considering the opportunities that exist now in the Biden administration, what are some possible changes in federal legislation you're most focused on this year? And what opportunities now exist that was not present before for climate health equity and environmental justice? Well, um, you know, I'm um, focused a lot on the ex work behind the executive orders, you know, not the, um, I mean, I'm excited by the fact that so far 38 have been released, but more than 12 of those specifically mention environmental justice. And now it comes, you know, the question becomes, how are these going to be implemented? And I, I say that um, because we have a number of people um, in the administration now who have experience, environmental justice experience. So it'd be exciting to watch how that plays out. I'm also um, hardened by the fact that science is back in um, its rightful place. And you know, because of the importance behind it when it comes to data analysis and data gathering. So that's what I'll be watching. And in the past, what we have not had is science being recognized um, for its importance or uh, the effect of um, a variety of different issues around environmental justice. So this is an important historic time for us, but it's not the only time. It should be the beginning of the way things are to continue. So that um, and sort of what Dr. Newsom um, uh, said, uh, White Newsom said that, you know, um, that things are gonna be, you know, are gonna be different. Like there is no normal for me. There's a new normal and that new normal involves everybody. So thank you. Yeah, the only thing that I would add, I mean, I, I don't work directly on federal policy anymore, but, what I will say is one thing that I am encouraged about is the fact that there is conversation as to how <laughs> you're, 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 you're assessing risk and not doing it in silos. I think the Environmental Protection Agency and other agencies have talked a lot about cumulative impacts. <laughs> and it's been like this really hard thing to measure, to quantify, to push and appreciate. And so my hope is that that becomes not just another part of this conversation, but there are actually actions taken on that. How do you begin to assess cumulative risk, whether it's Department of Transportation, EPA, whatever, and do that in a way that is in partnership with those communities that have been experiencing multiple environmental insults for so long. So that, that's one thing that I, that I am excited about. And I hope, um, you know, on the other end, will bring more accountability to all of these institutions at the federal, state, and local level that are responsible and are charged with protecting our health. One, 
one of the things, one of the specific things I'm excited about is the focus on mapping environmental justice, because we're in a position now that I don't think we were in the last time the federal government had major action on environmental justice. And that's in these novel exposure assessment tools like satellite remote sensing and distributed networks of low cost sensors and mobile monitoring. So we have the ability now to have information at the neighborhood scale in a way that we didn't before. And I think that's going to shed a lot of light on the, you know, what neighborhoods are experiencing and, and um, you know, who, who, you know, where we might uh, marshal our efforts to improve quality of life for people. All right, I believe um, Dean Goldman, you had a question. I do have a question for each one of you, actually. So one of the things that um, Jalan mentioned that I think is so important is the need to um, impact philanthropy and how philanthropies look at this issue. And I was struck earlier this year by the fact that um, Bill Gates, who came up with a new book about climate and is in embracing you know, climate as an issue for philanthropy, is so silent about climate and health where he, he, he and i i'm seeing that what dr perry said and i'm sorry that we lost her what dr perry said is still true in many quarters even people who recognize how significant the climate problem is don't see the connection to health so <laughs> selfishly i'm asking you guys you know if you had 15 20 seconds with bill gates you know, on an elevator, you know, you know, the vaunted elevator speech. How would you use that time to put this issue in front of him? Why should he be cognizant that health is linked to climate? What should he, what should his foundation and other foundations, other philanthropists be doing to support us as we're trying to address this issue? I don't know who wants to go first. I just I Jalan, maybe since you've raised it. <laughs> Oh boy, um, I you know coming from uh, again the Kresge Foundation where we spent a lot of energy, no pun intended, really trying to solidify that connection between climate change, health, and equity, and it was a privilege and honor to be a part of that program. But I would say you know it's still a, again a hard sell for some reason, which seems ridiculous to you know philanthropy to kind of get behind what do we really need to push on uh, the issue and push more investment, and so. Um, in thinking about a, a conversation with, with Mr. Gates, I mean, I guess I would maybe say two things. One, investing more in communities and frontline communities and, and their solutions is, is it's, it's a non-starter. Um, and then the second piece, which I think is one of the, the gaps and challenges, we have a huge infrastructure problem, particularly in our low to medium uh, size communities, uh, particularly around water infrastructure, which I spent a lot of time on. And there's these, these gaps in investments that continue to put these communities at risk, multiple communities um, that are either on the other side of the tracks or you know, have dilapidated infrastructure. So really kind of trying to seed investments that will bring like sustaining change in communities that in, in I think about water infrastructure because I think about the lead and copper pipes and those issues. I think about combined sewer overflows, like that is something that's super personal to me. And so I would ask him to invest in communities, but also invest in infrastructure in the communities that don't seem to get the investments that they need. Yeah, for, um, I totally agree with what um, Jalan said. And also um, someone just asked me this question, not just about um, Mr. Gates, but also about um, Bezos, and I forgot his name, the gentleman who wants to plant 3 billion trees. And um, the, my answer is, would be the same for each of them, is look at the impact of what you're doing. Um, I know for what um, Bill Gates wants to do, there is some potential impact on communities. But then I would also say, look at who's around the table when you're coming up with these uh, issues. Who are your partners? Why are you not involved? You know, who's missing from the table? Where are the communities? You know, and people need to step out of, of, of their silo for sure. But you need to ensure that those who are going to be most affected have a voice in whatever project you're coming up with. 
Um, and, and I think that a lot of these are opportunities for economic growth. For example, with the, the billion trees, who's going to maintain that whole, you know, I think it's a great idea, but and it's also an opportunity for farmers, for uh, people to have uh, jobs maintaining these uh, issues. So maintaining these um, um, objectives. So I think that for, for him, I would say, first of all, you can't talk about climate change without talking about health. There's just no way you can do that. And then you, it, within that, you have to talk about environmental health, environmental justice. So I would corner him literally in an elevator to <laughs> tell him that you, you're leaving out more than half the story and then invite him to speak with people who could um, provide that knowledge for him, you know, who could partner with him to give him that missing piece of information. All great ideas to a very difficult question. Thank you, Dean Goldman, for challenging us. Um, I think I would just start from saying, you know, the whatever strategy we choose, we have to bring multiple stakeholders in the public along with us. And it is really health, the lens of health that um, galvanizes people. And, you know, it, we, whenever you see these uh, um, studies of public perception of, of climate change and, and which messengers are most effective, you know, health always comes out on top. and hearing from doctors in the health community um, really is an effective way to um, inform people about climate change. And so I think it's a, um, you know, it's a key uh, lens that need, is needed to be brought into the equation to bring multiple stakeholders along. And with that, it looks like we are probably out of time and we've gone over actually. So thank you so much, all of our panelists, round of applause for everyone. I know it's very hard in the remote uh, cyberspace we're living in. Um, but really enjoyed it today. And thank you so much, Dean Goldman, for bringing us together and, um, and hosting us. Really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you who stayed with us a, a, a little bit over time. It was great to have such a, a wonderful audience um, with us today for this uh, seminar. We'll be in touch with you about future topics, some of which probably will involve environmental health as well. But I, I'm so appreciative, not only to Dr. Annenberg, but also to Tania Valmar and Natasha Kazim for helping us to organize um, this. And, uh, and thanks also to Nick Pendleton, who works with Dr. Annenberg. Thank you so much. It's so exciting to see our trainees involved with issues that are so important um, nationally. Bye. And uh, it's been, been a real privilege, Lauren, um, Adrian, and Jalan, to um, be able to, to see you as well in, in this. Bye-bye. Uh,